Okay, good morning. We are in the third week of our series around emotions called Inside Out. Just trying to figure out what it looks like to live from the inside out, from redeemed emotions, rather than from the outside in, where most of us tend to live, right? Stuff happens out here, and it changes our inner state, and then that flows out again. And so today we're going to talk about freedom from regret which I'm sure if we're over 10 years old, we all have some regrets. And I I told you last week that this series has been hard on me because every topic, God has been like, hey, yeah, you want to talk about that? Okay, boom, it hits me on the head. Well, this week, as we were getting ready for this, I'm at a point now, I I, I was at a retreat, I came back and I told Doreen Friday morning, I said, you know, I got to call our girls and have some conversations. And so um, I don't want to be alone in that, so I'm hoping that some of you also will look back after we're done today and go, man, there's some conversations I got to have to resolve some regrets. So what we're going to look at today is a story in David's life where he had to face his regrets. And, and it's, it's from 1 Chronicles chapter 28, and then he wrote Psalm 145. And, and so he's, he's dealing with his son Solomon at the end of his life, getting ready to release Solomon, but there's this regret that's in the center of this conversation and this release. So if you don't mind, would you stand with me? We're gonna read um, from 1 Chronicles 28, verses seven through 10, then we're gonna skip down to verse 20 and read verse 20 and 21. So this is at the end of David's life. He knows he's getting ready to go be with God and he's talking with Solomon. And so verse seven, David said to Solomon, my son, I had it in my heart to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name because you have shed so much blood before me on the earth. And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Be careful now. For the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Then David said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed for the Lord God, even my God is with you. He will not leave you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. And behold, the divisions of the priests and the Levites for all the service of the house of God and with you in all the work will be every willing man who has skill for any kind of service. Also the officers and all the people will be holy at your command. Father, we thank you. We know, Lord, that it's impossible to live a life that doesn't leave us with some regrets if we're honest with ourselves. And so, Father, I pray that today you open our hearts and our minds to the regrets that we have, but you also reveal to us the way we can resolve those regrets and find freedom from those regrets through David's words in Psalm 145. And so we're here today asking that you would open our hearts, open our minds, but more importantly, connect us with you, connect us with each other in deep ways so that your work continues generation after generation for your glory and for the benefit of others. Amen. You can have a seat. So we're going to do something a little different today. As you can tell, there's three stools up here, and it's going to be taxing on me to try to stay in one spot, but I'm going to pull it off, I hope. And so we're going to invite um, some of our young folks up to have a conversation. So Brooke and Logan, will you guys come up? Yeah, it's okay to applaud for them because they're awesome. <laughs> so, so here's why we're having this conversation because David was facing the regrets in his life, at the end of his life, for not being able to build the temple. And, and he uh, recognized that the work of God was actually multi-generational. It wasn't just his. And, and so David 
after uh, having this conversation with Solomon in 1 Chronicles 28, he sits down and he writes um, Psalm 145. And what David is saying in Psalm 145, we're gonna pick at it a little bit this morning, but what he's saying is that the work of God transcends generations. It was not just David's work. And so David is handing off the work of God that he was pressing into. He's handing it off to Solomon and to the next generation. And if you dig into these verses in Psalm 145, you're gonna see that David does what we and every church needs to do to deal with our regrets in a healthy way. And so the first thing David does is he remembers, right? We've talked about that structure in Psalms. Remember, rest, enjoy. So Psalm 145, the first thing David does is he remembers. He remembers that it's all about God and not him. This is the first lesson for us. When we have regrets, I'm not gonna regret the things that I didn't do for me or accomplish for me because I can't resolve those regrets. I'll just live under the shackles of those regrets. But what I can regret and do something about is the way my life of faith has played out. What have I done for the Lord? Are there things I missed the mark on? So in Psalm 145, verse one, David says this, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever. So so David remembers that it's about God. The next thing he does in verses four through seven in Psalm 145 is he rests. He rests in the knowledge that he has prepared the next generation to pick up the work he didn't complete. And so there's rest in that. And so he talks about one generation shall commend your works to another. The work of God in the church is not something that's done by one group. It's something that we continue and carry on and we carry forward. And so David knows that he's gotta commend the next generation and that they're gonna speak and that they're gonna pour forth. And then finally, David finds joy in God's multi-generational presence. That's when he says, the Lord is near to all who call on him. So here's the broad strokes of this. David hit four key areas in Psalm 145, which oddly enough, research is saying that young people are truly concerned about in the church today post-COVID. And so, so those four areas are acceptance and authenticity in relevance, and really truly being the church. And so what we're gonna see through the conversation we're about to have is how David in Psalm 145 recognized those things and is doing that with Solomon. And my prayer is that we will be a people who do that here because some of us are getting near the end of our ministerial lives, the ministry we've done. It's time to equip commission and release the next generation. And so that's how we can truly find freedom from our regrets. Because I don't have to regret the work of God that I didn't finish for whatever reason when I have Logan and Brooke behind me and I can hand that work to them and they can be about that work for decades to come. And then they can hand that work to the next generation, to the kids who are down in Treehouse right now one day, and the things that we stepped into and said, God, we know this is what you're calling us to do, but we also know this work is more than one lifetime. So bring us many, many lifetimes. And he does that, and he'll continue to do that. And so the first thing we're gonna look at is this idea of acceptance. So here's what David did in 1 Chronicles 28.1. Listen to this. David assembled at Jerusalem all the officials of Israel, the officials of the tribes, the officers of the divisions that served the king, the commanders of thousands, the commanders of hundreds, the stewards of all the property and livestock of the king and his sons, together with the palace officials, the mighty men, and all the seasoned warriors. Do you see what David did there? He pulled in everybody so that they would accept Solomon as the king. With you watching, I'm handing this off. As a church, we need to do that. We need to pull in all of the people and hand it off. And so one of the things that's coming out of post-COVID research for younger people, for young adults and students, is they wanna be accepted at church. They want this to be a place of acceptance, 
a place where they can be themselves and experience a non-judgmental family and to serve and belong. And so they want a place where they can connect, not just with people who look like them, but connect with people in general. And so here's my question I have for you guys. And you get, you get a chance to enlighten us a little bit. When I say us, I mean people that look like me, that, you know, who's, who sound like a bowl of Rice Krispies when they stand up nowadays and knees and backs pop and um, act like we can still do what you do, but we really can't. And we don't tell you that when we wake up the next morning sore. So here's what I, the, the first question I want to ask you guys. Why do you think this need to be accepted by young adults in the church is so much greater after COVID than it was before COVID? So Brooke, you have the microphone, you can start. <laughs> I would think like the need to be accepted has always been there, but I think when we lost our community for a while, mm. it just, that need became a lot more evident. And then when we came back, we were just really searching for like that community we wanna be accepted. So I think it was always there, but just how we lost our community, it just really enforced that. So, so Logan, that same question, what, so, what do you think's changed? <clears throat> One thing I think is, um, uh, like during COVID, everyone was, well, I mean, I mean, my age, I guess, and everyone's age, we we're like all isolated and stuff. And um, uh, at least me, like I lost a lot of connection with my friends. Like I was very disconnected. And so it's a lot easier to, um, like now post COVID, it's easier to stay disconnected than to like reconnect, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. So, so here's my follow-up question for you guys with that is, I'm going to try to say this in a way that's not, <laughs> that's not insulting to us older folks, but I think a lot of times our perception is that you really don't want to connect with us. Do you feel like that's the case or does it feel more like you don't know how or where to do that? Well, I... Um... I, I mean, personally, I definitely want to connect with people that are um, like you. Um, <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> because, um, like, <laughs> it's just, I know that um, I'm young, like me and Brooke and like the rest of the, the youth and stuff, like we're, we're really young. And like, even though we, we think we know a lot of things, um, it's nice to like learn from older people to um, like that have gone through the same things that we're going to go through and just, you know, be able to learn from people instead of just making the same mistakes. Yeah. yeah. So, so Brooke, here's a question I have for you that might be, um, it's, I think it's an opportunity to undo some mythology. Given the opportunity, would you rather connect with people face to face or virtually? Face to face. Do you guys hear that? <laughs> we have to stop assuming that just because people are younger, they would much prefer to do this than this. And so part of what's on us as the older generation is to invite them into the face to face as much as they may complain. Like we get it in our house, get off the tablet. <laughs> but as much as they might complain, They'd still prefer that, it sounds like. So, so here's my next question. And this is a hard one, but it's for both of you. And, and don't feel like you have to have the perfect answer because I don't think there's a perfect answer. But for us as a church, those who have kind of built this church and this culture, what would it look like for you to be accepted in the church community? One thing, like, for me, I would say is have people who want to come alongside me and do life with me, who want to like push me towards God in a loving way. And when they see I'm going in a different way, just bring me back to God and just really love on me and do life with me, like mentoring and having that group of people. So, so that's a powerful thought, isn't it? Um, and you know what's interesting to me is that's something we all need. That's not an age issue, that's a, a, a humanity issue. So how about for you, Logan? What would it look like to feel accepted in a church community? Well, I think um, one thing is just like, um, I don't know, there's a lot of, I guess, well, there can be like stereotypes, but like young people, oh, I don't wanna, 
I don't well, need could, help not or that whatever. Could be there well, there is, there is, yeah. yeah there is, there's stereotypes yeah. like, oh, like I don't, I don't need help. I know what I'm doing. Or like um, older people can sometimes say like, oh, like whatever, they'll figure it out. But it's, it's nice to have someone to, um, to go to when you are struggling um, because I don't know, it's just a lot easier with people. So, so implied in that then is acceptance also includes a place where you can share your struggles. Yes. Yeah. And so questions and doubts are welcome, not simply just pushed off. Okay. Because I think there's a good lesson in that for us, that, that we need to create space where younger people can come in and, and have questions and doubts. You know, we hear this word deconstruction happening all the time. And personally, I'm of the opinion that, that when people fall into that deconstruction, it's usually after they came to their church and said, I have questions, I have doubts, I'm unsure, I want to have conversations. And the church told them, no, we're not talking about that. And they were left with no place to go other than into themselves. And so we have to be a church that when you come in and you go, man, I'm uncertain about some of these things where we can say, good, good, let's have the conversation. Because I think most churches have responded to younger generations, not just your generation, but generations throughout the history of the church, where when we came in and we said, I have doubts, we thought the opposite of doubt was certainty. And so we, here's more scripture and study and read more and, and do all those things. But you know what the opposite of doubt is? It's not certainty, it's faith. We have to be a people who will help you grow the capacity of your faith to hold those doubts, not just dismiss your doubts. And so does that resonate with you guys, that idea of helping you grow your faith rather than dismissing your doubts? Yes. Okay. And so that's something we can press into as the generation of David. And it's looking to the generation of Solomon and saying, hey, we didn't quite get it all done, but we want to commission you and send you out. And so the next thing that, that um, a lot of the research is saying now that, that the, the younger adults who are coming out of COVID want is acceptance. And, and so if you look at um, 1 Chronicles 28, verse 3, listen to this, or excuse me, authenticity. But listen to this verse in verse 3 where David gets authentic with Solomon. He says, but God said to me, you may not build a house for my name for you are a man of war and have shed blood. David didn't sugarcoat his life. He didn't try to hide anything. He got real and he got honest with Solomon. And he got real and he got honest with us. Every one of David's Psalms is David cracking open his life and saying, look, here it is. And so authenticity is a place to build relationships where you can have a place to learn and grow and question and be a part of an authentic community. And, and so a lot of young adults are reporting that the image of the perfect church just pushes them away. The church that they walk into and they look and everybody acts as if we have it all together invites them to leave. And so authenticity is, is a really high value target. And so my question for you guys is what do you guys see as authenticity in relationships, but also specifically in church. What does authenticity in church look like for you? I see it as people being open and honest with where they are in life. So if they're struggling, don't come to church like, oh, everything's perfect. Like, just like what you said, because when everyone, when you look around and everyone looks like everything's perfect and you know that you're not, it's just, you don't feel like you belong. Mm. So for me, it would be seeing that everyone's struggling in their own way and then like, coming together and pushing each other towards God, like working through it together. So kind of holding each other's hands as we're falling. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. How about you, Logan? What do you, what do you feel like authentic community looks like? I think it's just um, showing, being very intentional and um, genuine. Like one thing um, I know is like, so if I have a mentor that constantly reaches out to me and lets me know that they care for me, I know that I like I I know that I'm loved, right? And um, just I yeah I just feel like um, authenticity has a lot to do with um, 
intentionality. Okay. So, so that brings, me, brings up a question for me. Because communication patterns have changed dramatically across generations. So when you say reach out, for you, does like a, a brief little text message, how are you doing, does that feel like authenticity? Does that feel like reaching out? Um, depends. I don't know. Like, I guess it depends who it's coming from, I guess. Like some, I don't know, if it was someone who is always on their phone and they just text me, hey, how are you doing or whatever. I mean, that might not be a lot for someone. But if it's like someone, I don't know, someone like that doesn't use their phone very so often. Somebody like me again. Yeah, somebody <laughs> like you. Um, and if you were to say like send me a text message and say, hey, I'm just thinking about you and yeah, I was wondering how you're doing. Or say like, do you want to go out for a coffee or okay. something like that? Um, so, so I think I may be speaking out of turn for us older folks in here, but I think that's intimidating to us sometimes because I think sometimes what we think is, hey, I want to reach out, but I don't know how you guys communicate. <laughs> I don't know how to reach out. And, and also, you, know, you want to go grab a cup of coffee. You know, sometimes we start to feel like maybe that doesn't fit into your life. But it sounds like what you're saying is if we reach out to you on our terms, you're okay with it. We don't have to reach out on your terms. Yeah, totally. Okay. Yeah. You guys hear that? You don't have to become <laughs> you know, a 20-year-old that, that spends your life on Instagram and Twitter, is that still a thing? Instagram still a thing? Or yes, you guys yes. Moved? Okay, they haven't moved on from that. And, and, you know, become somebody who can speak the language and make sure that, you know, there's, yeah, it, I guess basically it's okay for us to be a doofus in your presence. Yeah, and that's, that there comes to, like, authenticity, too. Like, yeah. um, Isn't that freeing? Yeah. You guys can all be yourselves. <laughs> you can just tell, like, someone's being genuine if they're themselves, you know what right, I mean? I don't right. know. And so awkwardness is not something to be concerned about in reaching out. No. no. So Brooke, how about for you? Do, are you concerned about the awkward nature of some older folks reaching out? No. Okay. Okay. No, not at all. So I think that's important for us to hear as an older generation, that it's okay to be awkward <laughs> in trying to connect because it's authentic, right? And so the authenticity matters more. Um, so this is just a short answer question, just to, for us to kind of get the temperature around here. Do you feel, Brooke, like you can be yourself at Temple? I would say for me, yes, for the most okay. part. How about you, Logan? Do you feel like that? I would say um, yes, but um, not necessarily for the reasons that, like, I feel like I, feel like I can be myself. I just... Um, I'm just not like afraid to be myself, I guess. Yeah. That makes sense. No, you're not. You're not at all. <laughs> and, and so that's the other side of this, right? You know, both of them obviously are not people who are, who are wallflowers. They're up here right now. So, so we have to respect and appreciate that there are younger people who do struggle to be themselves, not just here, but everywhere. And so we have to create space for that too, right? That's welcoming and, and inviting those people in to say, yeah, I have, a, I have an authentic relationship here too. Um, let me ask you this before we move on to the next point. Do you feel like you need a whole bunch of authentic relationships or is one or two enough with the, the generation that went before you at church? Just, just like one or two okay. is totally enough, yeah. Okay. You feel the same way, Brooke? Yeah, I do. Like, I don't need, like, a whole huge group of people that are checking in on me all the time, but, like, some people in my life who really come along and care for yeah. me, just a couple. It's all. Yeah. So, so that's important for us, too, right? To understand that it might just be the one. There might just be one young adult in your life that you see on Sunday mornings that you have a connection with. Maybe you know their family. And you don't need to bring a whole tribe of people around them. It could just be you. We have people in our church who do that. And I hate to do this, but I'm going to do it. And, and Theo, I apologize. But Theo does that all the time with these boys that come in to play hockey. He knows that they don't need all of us, but they have him. And he reaches out and he walks with them in their daily lives. And, and what comes up in that daily walk from conversations I've had with Theo about this is faith. 
when he's with them, it's not always about, it doesn't start because Theo goes, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus. But he brings Jesus to them in his own person. We can do that. And I'm going to go even further. If you want help learning how to do that, see Theo. He's at the door every Sunday. <laughs> he can coach you and guide you in that because he, he, he has a life. We have a lot of guys in our church, a lot of ladies in our church who do this, and you never know it because it doesn't have to be a ministry that we form and shape. It simply has to be one person with a heart for Jesus reaching out to somebody else who's looking for him. And that's enough. And it sounds like you guys are saying, if that person's in your life, that's, that's enough. And so the, the authenticity comes when we can say, here's my struggles, here's my failings, here's my fallings, and, and I'm okay with bringing those into your presence. Here's the stuff I've been through. And I have a question about the authenticity. Do you want, what, what makes that better for you? Having somebody who can teach you or who will walk with you? Walk with me. Yeah, definitely walk with me. Yeah, and that was an attorney question. I knew the answer to that before I asked it. But I want us to understand that, that presence is way more important in relationships than, than education and intellect. And so I know a lot of us feel like, well, I don't have anything. I can't teach somebody younger than me. You don't have to. Just be present. Just show up. And that's what authenticity looks like. And so the, the, the next thing that we see in David and from David in Psalm 145 is um, in verses 6 and 7, or excuse me, 6 and 7 in 1 Chronicles 28. David makes it relevant so he goes to Solomon, and all of a sudden it becomes relevant. He says this. Uh, he's talking about God. Um, God said to me, he said to me, It is Solomon, your son, who shall build my house and my courts. For I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. I will establish his kingdom forever. If he continues strong in keeping my commandments and my rules as he is today. And so guess what? David recognizes that God's kingdom is a forever kingdom. Anything that lasts forever is always relevant. Anything that lasts forever is always relevant. And so when we have regrets, when we recognize that God's kingdom is forever, that makes it relevant to everyone ever. And so that's where we hand that work to the next generation because it's going to be as relevant, if not more relevant, as you guys rise up to lead the church as it is for us. It's not going anywhere. And so, so relevancy is a place where real people are gathering and they're doing life together and, and they're doing sustainable outreach to their community over a long term and it's a place where there's reconciliation and healing. And so, so the need for that doesn't end at one generation or another. And I would say that your generation might be more in need of reconciliation and healing than any other generation that's gone before when you look around our culture. And, and so what I want to ask you guys is this. What does it look like to have God be relevant in your day-to-day -day life? Not just at church. Let's leave Sunday out. But what about Monday through Saturday? What does it look like for God to be relevant in that space for you? I would say, like, trying to live life for him and having, like, the community around me. And, like, like when people ask me about him not denying who he is and trying to live for him and live, be like a light of who Jesus is to the world is, okay. like, how I try to keep him at the center of my life and keep him relevant. Okay. Logan, how about you? What does it look like to have God relevant in your day-to-day -day life? I think... Um a big thing is just not not only coming like to church on Sunday and being like spiritually fed, but on Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, um, like um, taking the time to actually like like pray and be intentional with God. Um, and I think it's important too to like because I mean if you think about it in like a literal way, if you're only getting fed on Sunday, like spiritually, 
I mean, you're going to be hungry the rest of the week. Right. And then right. Sunday you eat again or whatever. But, I mean, it's, it'd be better if you, like, I don't know, like had some more, like, nourishment during the week. It, it, so what I'm hearing in, your, in the answer that both of you are giving is that it's not so much about where am I going to live when I die, but how am I going to live if I don't die tonight? Yes. And, and so that's relevance, right? You know, the, the gospel message has a relevance to my life today and my life one day. And I wonder if maybe that's something that's become more clear for you guys in a, as young adults because of all the chaos in the world and the things that you're facing on a daily basis. And I know it's typical, we all say, right, oh, these poor kids today, they have it so hard. But you know what the reality is? That's true. It's true. They can access things in their lives, in their own homes, that when I was a kid, we would have had to work really hard to access it's just right there. It's in their back pocket all the time. Satan has a, a foothold in the technology that's so accessible. Not that the technology is evil, but there are many evil people who make evil things accessible through the technology. And so, yeah, it is different. It is harder. And, and so we have to be able to say, I'm going to walk with you Monday through Saturday. Not just be here on Sunday morning and say, good morning, how are you? And, and um, you know, the relevance is in our daily lives. And so the, there's a, it's, it's like the question of relevance becomes, what does my life look like with God in it? Is that a question that you guys typically ask? And what's your vision of that? <laughs> I think. <clears throat> can you say it again what yeah, is so, so do you have a vision of this question what does my life look like with God in it and how do you how do you pursue that it is something that's on my mind as I like when I went to school this year it was my first year of college so like I had a good Christian community in high school that got me through and then when going mm -hmm. to Lampton that all changed. So as I'm walking through the halls and going into classrooms, it was something that was definitely on my mind. Like how am I, how is God going to be part of my life in this new place? It is something that I think about. It's hard to, it's a hard question. That, that's, that's a powerful statement because I think a lot of times we don't realize how hard it is to make that transition into college or even out of college into your, your career because the community that you had is now shifted, it's gone. And so I wonder if maybe one of the things we do as a church, instead of constantly bemoaning the fact that kids, when they get done with high school, walk away from church, what if we built them up stronger before they finished high school? What if we taught them how to connect and feed themselves and find solitude with God as sufficient to keep them connected to him instead of giving them a community that they can lean on, which is really good, but never teaching them how to stand on their own. One, one thing is like Jesus said to make disciples. And so it's important um, like not to, not to be like, okay, these youth are going to church um, on Sunday, they're going to youth group, and they believe in God. That's, it's important to be a believer, but Jesus calls to be disciples, like, and like disciple makers, you know what I mean? Yeah. So. yeah, we probably should end right there, because that's okay. the wisest, most important thing that's been said. Um, unfortunately, we can't end right there, because I have more stuff that we need to talk about. <laughs> but if you guys would just put a, drop a pin on what Logan just said, put that in your pocket and hold on to it. We're called to make disciples. A disciple is someone who is adjusting everything in their lives to follow through on their decision to follow Christ in every moment. That's what a disciple is. I'm going to align everything in my life to follow through on this decision to follow Christ. And so I want to, I want to um, jump down real quick to this last point, the church and so we see this in, in 1 Chronicles 28, verse 20. I'm going to read that to you. 
Then David said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed for the Lord God, even my God is with you. He will not leave you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. And so now we're talking about the church. What is church? And it's a body that participates with, that trains up and shares the truth of Jesus with each other in a connected and compassionate way. So all that to say this, now let's talk briefly about what it looks like for you guys to be part of the church and for the church to be the church for you. And and so a lot of people are moving in younger generation. They're reporting that since COVID, they're moving further away from the church, but closer to Jesus. Ouch. That hurts. (laughs) That hurts. And so what we need to do, we need to to find a way to, to... Say, hey, you can find something here that you can't find anywhere else um, and invite people into finding that here, which is Jesus. So the question becomes, is it difficult to find what you typically found at church somewhere else in your life, or does it feel like church is the only place to find what you're looking for? Do you have options to find your faith, your spirituality in other places? For me, no. Like when I come to church, that's where I find my hope and my encouragement. Because like when the news is on, you see like a lot of sad stuff and a lot of hopeless stuff. Or even like in my own life when things go wrong and it's frustrating, it can be hard to see like any good. But then when I come to church, that's where I'm reminded that God is good and God is still working. He's not just like sleeping in the back seat or anything. And in the end, our God does win. And I can't find that anywhere else. I haven't gave up trying. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Same question. Is it hard for you to find what you find here anywhere else? Yes, um, it's, it is definitely hard to find like what I find here somewhere else because um, I mean, you, the, although there's lots of resources like online and stuff or whatever that, um, or through the week I can like read a book or something, but when I'm doing, like if I'm trying to learn about God, I can fall into this like trap of only hearing what I want to hear mm. and being very selective like, oh, I only want to hear, like, I don't know, say, this is, like, random. Say I believe that, like, Jesus rose on the fourth day, not the third day, and I can look at a bunch of stuff online that validates my opinion, but when I come to church, everyone, it's like everyone is different, and so it's a lot easier to, I don't know, have different points of view. So it it almost sounds, Logan, like what you're saying is that the faith that's building in you is the faith of everyone in this room. Yes. Think about that. Think about that. Us older folks. His faith is connected to our faith. There's a burden on us for that. We have to be good stewards. We have to be good stewards of our own faith, but we also have to be good stewards of the faith in the hearts of the generation behind us and build them up. What you're living is impacting way more than just you. We have to sit with that. We have to look in the mirror and say, if we stop and came to Logan and Brooke or anybody in their generation and said, look, I'm going to commission you. My life is ending. The work of the Lord at Temple needs to go on. It needs to go on in you. And we said, be strong and courageous and do it. Would their response to us be, do what? You haven't shown me what to do. Would their response to be, be, be strong and courageous like you are? Where, where, when every time they got your order wrong at the drive-thru, I saw you have a temper tantrum? Is that strong and courageous? 
Where, where when you just were tired and didn't feel like serving because you weren't getting what you wanted at church, was that strong and courageous? See, we have to look and say, the best of my faith that's lived out here is going to become part of their faith. The question is, what's the best of my faith that's lived out here? So we have to live it in a way that when you pick it up, when you guys pick it up and that becomes part of your faith, it's actually something worth carrying instead of something that should be cast aside and trampled on the ground. So I want to do something to, to wrap up. I wanted, my goal for today was this, that we as the generation that's been in the church would become intentional about saying, I want to help you grow in your faith and I'm going to reach out. And you as the generation that's coming up in the church would be humble enough to say, I want somebody to walk with me. Lord, open my eyes to the person who can walk with me for this season. We're not talking about a lifelong commitment. Maybe it is. But for this season, God, I want someone to walk with me. Help me find that person. And for this season, God, I want to walk with somebody. I want to pour into their faith. So help me find that person, God. That was my goal for today. But I want us to close with a time of prayer. So I'm going to ask you, younger people, to do something awkward and undignified. So if you're 30 or younger in this room, would you just stand up? And if you're over 30, will you find these people, gather around them? We're going to pray over this generation right now. So if you don't mind, stand up, gather around them, and I'm going to close this with prayer for us as the generation that's commissioning, equipping, but also as this generation that's picking it up. Father God, I thank you so much I thank you so much that your church is multi-generational, that it doesn't stop with one generation or the next, but it continues on, and there's work to do, and there's a work that you're doing, and we want to be a part of that, but we want the regrets of our lives to be resolved in the lives of the next generation. Lord, help us see the places where we didn't press hard enough forward with your kingdom, and help us commission those that are coming behind us, to be strong and courageous and do it, but also help us give them a clear picture of what it is that you want done. And so God, we praise you and we thank you that for for millennia behind us, your kingdom has been being formed and going forward. And we thank you that we as a generation that's at the point of the spear right now have had an opportunity to live in that. But we also know that there's more you want done, what we haven't done or couldn't do. And so we ask that you give us the wisdom to equip and commission and release the next generation behind us and let our feeling of regret be inspiration to do that. Knowing that the only freedom we find from regrets in serving you is to know that your purposes continue. And Jesus, we know that for the last 2,000 years, your purpose has been in the hearts and minds of your people. And if it takes another 2,000 years, God, let there be a generation that starts here at Temple that can say, yes, we were there, we were a part of it, and it goes all the way forward. And Lord, never let that change until the day you come back. But let this place always be a place where your purposes, your desire, your kingdom are sought, and that that seeking is contagious to every generation that will follow us until the day you yourself return, Lord Jesus. And we ask all this in your name. Amen.